So thank you for being here, everybody. Good to have you. Uh, Merry Christmas season. It's coming. It's, it's coming fast, as a matter of fact. You'll hear in a minute just how fast it's coming for me and my family. It's, it's uh, four days away. <laughs> so, fact, we're, we're tweaking the calendar a little bit. I've mentioned my family to you a little bit here and there, uh, and, and we're going to be leaving early tomorrow morning for our family Christmas. I mentioned a minute ago that Christmas is coming early for the guests at home because of uh, we're sharing our kids with their in-laws and, and, and Christmas programs at school and church and all that. So we're, we're leaving tomorrow morning for a road trip to Pasadena, California, where we're going to connect with our family. I, I thought I'd show off my family. You want, want to meet my family? Yeah. All right, let's meet my family. There they are. They're a good, good-looking gang there. We've got, uh, that's my wife Murph. Most of you probably have met her. Uh, Minnie, our daughter, and Amy, our older daughter. Minnie and Matt got engaged in October. Yeah, uh, we're working on a wedding for them, all set for next April, April 2nd. We'll, I'll be walking her down the aisle. On this side is uh, Amy and her husband Josh, with our grandsons Corbin, Judah, and our little grand girl Eden. So, uh, as I look at them, I can't wait to hug them all, most of them tomorrow. <laughs> spoil them. Huh? Spoil them. Oh, oh spoil them is right. Oh yeah, that's, that's, not, that's the reason for our existence these days. So yeah, I uh, uh, appreciate your prayer for that. My wife, a lot of you know, has some pretty severe uh, disabilities that don't don't keep her from moving around and doing stuff. But road trips are very difficult for her. So uh, we just had a prayer meeting here a few minutes ago, a Union Church prayer meeting, and I, I prayed, Lord, would you surprise her with how much energy she ha energy she has at the end of a seven hour trip? So if you wouldn't mind praying that along with us, we'd be we'd be very grateful for that. Uh, yeah, uh, it's severe enough that. A lot of you know we also have a, a missions care ministry for missionaries. Uh, we've decided Murph really can't fly very well. Uh, I'll be in Thailand, Lord willing, in January. There's no way she could make a trip like that. It's just too long sitting in a plane. In one, uh, a lot of you know what, what kinds of limitations that, that constant pain can create. So I appreciate your prayer for the road trip. Uh, and then we're, we're constantly adjusting how much we ask of her in our missionary care ministry. Uh, I do most of my travel without her. Occasionally, she can join us depending on the kind of trip. But anyway, appreciate your prayer for that tomorrow. And I realized the other day, as I, as I thought about this class, I thought, you know, we've never taken a picture of the class. Would you guys mind if I snap a little selfie? And uh, I just I want to have a memento. Let me see my... Are we making Yes. Yeah. 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 When I say three, just kind of wave or smile or not just the wave thing. Wave is more fun. Okay, hold on a second. All right. There we go. Okay, everybody start waving. Oh, I got to get everybody in there. No, oh, there's people not in there. Hold on. Oh, you can't expand when you're. Okay, you're not all going to be in there, but most of you. Ready? One, two, three. Smile and wave. Hey. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for putting that in my mouth. That's right. That's right. Okay, now we're still in one. Okay. Is that going on Facebook? Well, let me pray, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started tonight, eventually, in Romans chapter 4. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this group. Thank you for gathering us tonight in the midst of a busy season and with a lot of physical challenges and different families, and yet we're here, and we're ready to listen to your spirit and to enjoy the truth of your word. We pray that uh, that you would speak to us, because we are here to learn from you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, how many of you are familiar with the, the realtor cliche, the, the three most important things about uh, a house are, are what? Location, 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 location. location, location. Or neighborhood, some, neighborhood sometimes people say. Yeah, the, the same is true. Bathrooms, right? <laughs> My wife would say kitchen. All right, come on, let's, let's get serious here. Uh, but that same principle applies to Scripture. Uh, and that's what we use with context when we're talking about Scripture. So each time when we meet, I'm going to do a quick review because you can't really understand the passage of the day until you remember where we've come from. Because location, location, location matters most in understanding God's Word or, or context in our case. So in a quick review, uh, for that reason, plus we haven't met in quite a while, it's been, it's been a few weeks since we got together, so let's refix ourselves in the flow of thought that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul as he wrote this letter. 
Uh, it's very clear early on, as you recall, that uh, the Holy Spirit wanted him to explain the gospel on a level of detail that is not found anywhere else in the Bible. Romans is unique in how deep it goes into the details of what the good news of Jesus truly is. Uh, and he makes that clear that that was his theme in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, when he says, if you recall, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That passage uh, foreshadows the fact that he was going to talk a lot, as we've already seen, about those two audiences. That uh, we would use the word pagan, maybe, they use the word Greek, use the word Gentile. People who came to trust in the Messiah of Israel with no other contact with Israel. They were Greeks, they were Romans. That's part of the audience he's addressing, but he also is keenly aware, and we'll see that today again, that he's addressing Jewish believers in the Messiah. And that each of them come to their faith and to their life in the family of God as Christ followers. They come from very different backgrounds that create uh, some, some opportunities to express the unity. That the, uh, one of God's goals is to, to fill heaven with people from all over the world, and, and the church on earth is supposed to look like that supposed to be a little foretaste. Uh, and so uh, Paul is thrilled that there are both groups present in the church in Rome. But he's also keenly aware that that creates some tensions and some challenges for them to live and to understand Jesus with a common vocabulary. So uh, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this letter about the gospel. Uh, he jumps right into, after making that statement that he's not ashamed of the gospel, he jumps right into, in chapter 1, the idea of the wrath of God. That as a holy God, God must be wrathful against the destruction sin has brought about in his world. And although uh, God gets a bad rap uh, in a lot of places because, I don't know people, but why is God so mad all the time? You know, why is God angry? And, and some people even will say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. He's always ticked off. <laughs> okay. I like Jesus better because he's nice. Okay. <laughs> you hear that contrast being drawn. And yet, how could God be God if he wasn't angry? We get angry when we see destruction. We got, how can you watch the news on any given day without some response of disgust or, or dismay or anger, or maybe even wrath, when you, when you hear stuff going on, and, and we even call for justice. We, as imperfect human beings, we want the bad guys to get caught and to get punished. And, and we're imperfect. Very perfect people. How could a holy God who looks down on his creation and realizes what has happened and what human rebellion has created, how could he not be angry? Uh, he wouldn't be holy if he wasn't. So he jumps right into the wrath of God. Uh, he talks about evidence for God being everywhere and people should be bowing the knee to him, but they exchange the truth of God for a lie. At the end of chapter 1, God, Paul mentions three judgments. He says God gave them up. Initially to general impurity and promiscuity, God basically said, okay, you want to go off on your own? Go ahead, but here's what that's going to look like. Your life will, will, be, will be such a mess because you're refusing to submit it to me. General impurity and promiscuity. Secondly, we mentioned homosexual practice. Thirdly, I use the phrase, a generally debased mind. Paul says there, to do what ought not to be done. Uh, so those three judgments are clear at the end of chapter one. And... For a Jewish audience, you might recall, the kinds of specific sins he mentioned there were very common in the Greek world, in the non-Jewish world. But they were sort of, a Jewish reader would go, oh yeah, those guys are a mess. Go get them, Paul. Just tee off on them. They need to hear the truth. <laughs> so, so a Jewish reader might be inclined to think, oh, I'm so glad Paul has finally given the world what it deserves. You know, with a little bit of a smug, we're so much better than that. So in chapter 2, he responds to that imaginary Jewish critic in his mind, reading chapter 1, and agreeing with what he's saying, but not seeing themselves in that picture. So in chapter 2, uh, his, he makes the point that everyone needs the gospel. That even those who glory in their circumcision, glory in the fact that they're part of the people, of the chosen people of God, the people of Israel, we are so better off than those guys. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, he's imagining his Jewish readers are responding like the, the Pharisee in the parable that Jesus tells, you might remember. The two men are praying in two different ways before God. 
and the public and the tax collector. Oh, at first the Pharisee begins, and the Pharisee says, oh, God, I'm, uh, I'm so glad I'm not like everybody else. Thank you for making me who I am, and it's kind of reveling in his privilege uh, before God. And the tax collector is in the back of the room, back of the crowd, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus is, at, or Paul's anticipating, some of his Roman Jewish readers are having that kind of mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're privileged. We're the ones who have a leg up on everybody else. So he points out, your circumcision is worthless without obedience. And he points out that Jews and Gentiles alike stand condemned because of their sin. That to whom much is given, much is required. And those of you who, who claim to, to have God's word, to have God's truth, to know what God expects of you, do you do it? Or are you falling short of God's expectations in the same way your Gentile neighbors are? That's going to come up again today as we look at chapter 4. Chapter 3, you might recall, if you were here for that conversation, Paul kind of continues in the same theme he had in chapter 2, and, and he anticipates a question, again, from the Jewish Christian readers. Are there any advantages to being the chosen people? If what you say in chapter 2 is right, Paul, then we're all a mess, and we all stand in need of the same forgiveness. We're all under the same wrath of a holy God. Is there any advantage to being Jewish. And he says, yes, uh, there is. Of course there's advantages. Look, look at your history. Look at what God did for you. Uh, you are the chosen people. God, until recently, Paul would say, God spoke Hebrew. <laughs> okay, and only Hebrew. He spoke your language. People who wanted to worship God from around the world had to come to Jerusalem to do it. Yes, you're in a good spot. But you still fall short because to whom much is given, much is required. And Paul makes the maybe the darkest passage of, of the early part of Romans, he says all, both Jews and Gentiles alike, are under sin. We're all in the same boat. We all have the same needs. Uh, and whether you see yourself as better than everybody else or worse than everybody else, we're all stand in need of the same forgiveness that he's going to get into at the end of chapter 3. Uh, there's a dark summary statement. Uh, uh, yeah, all, both, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. <coughs> I think these chapters elevate, to me, the significance of sin. And I say that because we are so prone to diminish it. We're so prone to, to say, especially our sins aren't as bad as the sins of other people. Uh, and they're bad, we're not. I, I, think, I, I fall into that trap. I think we all do on some level. I used an illustration a while. I think I used the sunspot illustration uh, three weeks ago. That a sunspot, a black spot up against the sun, if you took it out, if you could take out that sunspot and hang it in, in blank space, it would shine like a star. But compared to the sun around it and behind it, it goes black. We can say how good we look, but we hold ourselves up to Jesus. We don't look so good anymore, right? That's one illustration I like to use. Another one happened here with, with my younger daughter uh, about three years ago. She came up to... to hang out with us, and we went out and got some takeout food. I won't tell you from where, because of what I'm about to tell you. Uh, she got macaroni and cheese, and we're sitting there in my living room eating it, and she looks down and says, pulls up a hair. Yeah, yeah you, right? <laughs> and could you imagine me saying to her, as she held it up, it was kind of drippy with cheese, it was really gross. Uh, what if I had said, well, honey, just it's just one little hair, just... But put it back and eat around it. <laughs> okay. Of course you don't say that. You throw that away, and you, you call the place, which we did, and say, hey, uh, can we get another one, please? Or, or you go somewhere else. <laughs> More likely. Okay. If, if, you, if you could compare your sin, my sin, to that hair in the macaroni and cheese, if, if that one little hair disgusts us enough to say that entire plate is worthless, Imagine how much one sin, if we only had one. Anybody here guilty of just one <laughs> sin? <laughs> Back in the day, we were old enough to remember the Lay's uh, potato chips commercial. <laughs> but you can't eat just one? Okay, but you can't commit just one. All right, <laughs> excuse a sin illustration. Imagine the holy God's reaction of you to a life, even if there were just one. And there's so much more than that, as we all know. So, that's... Through the first half of Romans chapter 3, that's the message. And the rest of the book makes no sense if we skip over that too quickly or we don't let it sink in and absorb it. Because the illustration I like to use is 
the bad news makes the good news good. And the more we grasp the bad news, the more we grasp the impact of our sin, the responsibility of it, the guilt of it, the more we stand amazed when we get to the end of chapter 3. Because to that ugly, lost world, to that world full of much more hair than macaroni, <laughs> okay, if I can use that gross illustration one last time, God finds a way to intervene and to start fixing things. And there's a turning point in chapter 3. Uh, after verse 20, he says, "By Oh, and, and again, thinking about his Jewish readers, they're probably thinking, well, yeah, God gave us the law. He gave us the Old Testament commandments so that by keeping them, we could improve and we could make the world a better place. But Paul makes a rash statement in Romans 3, verse 20. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. He basically says, the purpose of the law isn't to make you good enough to, to stand before a holy God. The purpose of all is to show you, you can't be good enough to stand before a holy God. It's to show the best among us, the most committed, the most holy, the, the Pharisees of, of, of the world, to show, look, even at your best, you are so far from who you need to be. So the law wasn't given to make you righteous, to make you justified. The law was given to show you how much you need some other way to be justified. And at the end of chapter 3, he jumps into that because the light comes on in chapter the verse 21 of chapter 3 when he starts with but now there's the there's the turning point there is the we're going from bad news to good news but now the righteousness of god has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it here it comes the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all who believe he's not going to make the case that after convincing us of how helpless we are is it the good news that God found a way, not by showing us how to act better, but by declaring unrighteous people righteous? Not because they do righteous things, but because they choose to trust Jesus. They put their faith in Jesus. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more today. Light comes on. And he explains at the end of chapter 3, which we studied last time we met, that righteousness comes by faith in Jesus. There were six powerful words that we sadly could only spend a couple minutes on each word. They each deserve an evening <laughs> all by themselves. The words are justified. We'll talk about that again tonight. Grace, gift, redemption, propitiation, and faith. And that word faith, that last one, appears nine times in 11 verses. Don't forget the reason I color code the visual breakdowns of each chapter is to allow those repetitions to jump out at us. What's the most important part of this passage? What's the point he's really driving home? When you see those repetitions and the color brings them out, I hope, when you see those, you realize, okay, this idea matters. He didn't have to repeat himself, but he did. He's driving home a significant part of his argument. And the Holy Spirit is making that argument, not just Paul. So we see the, the, the importance of, of this idea, these powerful words that we'll unpack again as we go. Okay, that's my review. Let me just have a moment of, of uh, participation for a second, if you, if you feel like it. As we've done these first three chapters, what's, what stood out to you? What's been your takeaway? What's been your pleasant surprise or negative surprise? Or what did you go home thinking about and, and telling a friend about the next day as we looked at these first three chapters? Anything jump out that has been important to you? Yeah, sure. The gravity of sin. Gotcha. The gravity of sin, Sharon. I'll repeat it always for the video, by the way. But what, what, what has that done in your heart as you grasp that? Sure. Just like what you were talking about, we get in this mode of we diminish it. Right. Oh, that wasn't that big a deal. It was, we don't even recognize it as sin sometimes. It's just yeah. who we are, what we said. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we can dismiss it so easily. That's just how I am. Or, or worse, that's how God made me. I've I, I, I worked with so many people over the years who, when, if ever you get a chance to actually sit them down and say, okay, here's an issue I see in your life, I'd love to have, help you work through that. Uh, I'm thinking of a lady in France right now. Um, who, that was her common response. That's how I am. That's how God made me. He loves me anyway. But all that is true. <laughs> that doesn't mean you say, okay, no big deal. Okay, thanks, Sharon, for that. Somebody else, what's been your takeaway? Phil? We're all subject to sin. I love how Paul puts it in the end of the second chapter of Galatians, where he said, if righteousness come by law, then Christ died for nothing. Bingo. 
He's saying, uh, he's quoting Galatians. Oh, you probably heard it because the camera's next to you, so <laughs> the video probably caught it. Yeah, so I, I'm really glad to hear these two responses. Thanks for, for contributing. Anything else to jump out as some of the rest of them? Yeah, Paul. I'm going to read it. Okay. Uh, but this, is, this is in uh, 3, um, 22. In the righteousness that we get uh, from God, um, this righteousness through faith in Jesus, it's just, it's through faith, you know, and uh, we can't work for it or anything. Yeah. It's just, it's God so good. Yeah, it, it's that John Piper video. We, we, if you were here two weeks, three weeks ago now, yeah, it's it's you don't be declared righteous by acting righteous. You're declared righteous when you're non-righteous, when you're guilty, when you're a sinner. God declares the ungodly to be justified. We'll unpack that again today, because the question today is going to be in chapter four. Where did you come up with this, Paul? Is this some newfangled idea that, that you just pulled out of thin air? And Paul's going to make the case. No, it's been like this all along. If it surprises you, it's because you didn't get the Old Testament. <laughs> it's, it's pretty bold in chapter 4. Anyone else want to contribute? What's your takeaways have been? What's your thoughts have been as you walk away each night? Yeah. I mentioned this before in the past, but just the, the transition of identity. Uh, when we were talking about slavery, uh, you're no longer a slave. Um, that just really stood out to me in the sense that you can't go back to being a slave if you've been set free. Like, that's... That was really a, a clear picture for me. I love that. And he's talking about once you know you're set free, uh, to no longer be a slave of that sin. Chapter 6 is going to revisit that idea, and then chapters 12 through 16 is all about now that now that we are declared just, what kind of people should we be? Uh, are, are we going to keep making excuses for the sin that has been dominating us all our lives since before we came to Jesus? Now, should there not be a difference? Uh, but the important thing is, where does that difference fit in the plan of salvation? Do we, be, do we change in order to be accepted by God? Or do we change because we already are accepted by God? That's going to be a really key part of the next couple of weeks. All right, thanks for putting your name tag on your hat, Matt. That helps me a lot. <laughs> I appreciate that. Anyone else? Anyone else want to jump in? Okay, well, let's go ahead and move forward then. Uh, Paul's anticipating uh, an objection here, and I want to warn you as we start chapter 4, it's a nuancy chapter. And if you like nuance, you're going you're gonna to love it. If nuance kind of drives a little bit nuts, <laughs> you're going to wrestle with it. Because there is some nuance here, and you'll see that as, as we move ahead. As I said a minute ago, Paul is imagining somebody saying, where did this come from? It's, uh, it's too good to be true. You're making it sound so easy. Why are you changing what we've been taught, we Jewish believers? We've been taught for generations that we're supposed to keep the law so God will like us. We've been taught that this is how we earn credit with God, is to obey all these commandments. And you're saying no to that? Are you making this up out of thin air? Uh, go ahead to the next, next slide, Leah. There's a quote from one of the commentators that I consult on these things. It says, if Paul can establish as true that the father of the nation of Israel was justified by faith rather than works, he'll have scored heavily, especially with his Jewish readers. That's where chapter 4 is going to go. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, we're going to go to Abraham, we're going to go to David. If you've already read it, you know what's coming. And he's going to make the case. Again, he's like, he's like a lawyer, making his closing statement in front of a jury. This isn't new, this has been this way from the start, let me explain to you why I know that. Okay? So, in order to, to, to grasp that, he's going to go initially to Abraham. I don't want to assume everybody knows Abraham's story, so I want to take a couple minutes just to set the, set the stage for what he's going to be talking about. Uh, Lee, I think there's another slide, maybe two foot go to the map. There's no map? Oh, I'm not, okay. All right, I don't need a map. I can just. No, no, that's all right. I can picture it. <laughs> Leave without a map. That's kind of, that's kind of painful. <laughs> Let me go through. Let me go with you through. I uh, will show you where it all happens. But this is this is Abraham's story. It's in the context of Genesis chapter twelve. Preceding Genesis chapter twelve is all the creation stories and the fall and the flood and the Tower of Babel. In the midst of all that, God gives a little glimpse of good news. In Genesis chapter three, I referred to this before. It's, it's often called the Proto Evangelium, the first gospel. In Genesis chapter three, as he's cursing Satan. You might recall God says, someone will come someday to fix this. You will bruise his heel. He will crush your head. 
And that's a, that's the very first prophecy that shows this didn't surprise God. He knew this was coming. He had a plan, so plan to fix it right from the start. Uh, and then he starts implementing that plan in more detail in Genesis chapter 12. Because what happens is, uh, we, enter, we meet Abraham uh, through his father, actually. His father uh, decides to take his family from Ur of the Chaldeans over in Mesopotamia to across to, to, to Canaan eventually. They settle in a town called Haran where his father dies. Or is his uncle? I think it's his uncle. Anyway, somebody dies. Uh, and in Genesis... <laughs> happens a lot, as a matter of fact. In, in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, we have this first interaction between God and Abraham who will become the father of the nation of Israel. I want to read Genesis 12, 1 through 4 just so we understand the beginning of this relationship between God and his chosen people. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kinsmen and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and, the one, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's saying, I've got a plan. I wasn't caught flat-footed. I'm not helpless before this rebellion. And I'm going to start implementing that plan now. Through you and your family, I will make you into a nation. And through you, I will bless all the families of the earth. That's an early indicator that God's plan wasn't just for the people of Israel. It included them, but it wasn't limited to them. And that's a big point as we go through the epistles. Now, Paul. That's the Abrahamic covenant. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 15 also we'll get to in a minute. Is also referred to as the Abrahamic Covenant, but oh, let's go ahead and look at that now. Genesis 15, we have another connection between God and Abraham. Genesis 15, I'll read, uh, what am I going to read? 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram's looking around and saying, you say I'm going to become a great nation? i got no kids. How are you going to do this? How are you going to fix this? Uh, verse 3, Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. The Lord, word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, the number of the stars, if you're able to number them. Then God said to him, So shall your offspring be. And here's the phrase that matters most for today. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. If that phrase is familiar from Romans chapter 3. That's the point Paul's going to make and drive it home all through Romans chapter 4. Maybe to a point where you're going to say, okay, we get it. <laughs> but again, he's anticipating opposition. He's anticipating resistance, and he wants to drive home the idea from the beginning. It was belief, it was trust that created righteousness, not obedience to rules. And he's going to point out the timing of this in the life of Abraham is going to be crucial in just a few minutes. So turn back to Romans chapter 4. Now we finally, about after half an hour, got into the <laughs> passage of the day. Thanks for bearing with my, my tangents and my context conversations. Romans 4, we, we see the, the neighborhood in which this message finds itself. Let me read verses 1 through 5. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and it was counted in his righteousness. Now here comes the comparison between wages and gifts, between a salary and a present. To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. He has earned it, he deserves it. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, there's some key ideas in there that uh, hopefully having reviewed the way we did, they jump out at you. Uh, verse 3, you might, you might have recognized as a direct quote from Genesis 15, 6. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, what I want us to grasp is the significance of between wages and gifts. If we are called, as so many people in Paul's day thought, and if we took a survey on the streets of Prescott, the average person believes today that we have to be good enough. We have to measure up. If you're talking to someone who maybe believes in an afterlife, 
believes God exists, doesn't dispute it, has no connection with Jesus, but yeah, someday I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to be judged by a God somehow, somewhere. I sure hope I pass. I hope I've got enough good on my scale that it outweighs the bad, and if that works out in my favor, I'll, I'll be okay. I'll have earned my way into whatever wonderful afterlife, whatever people want to call it. But in that mindset, it comes down to, what have I earned? Am I going to get what I earned? And this passage says, it's not about earning. Eternal life, salvation, is not a salary. It's not a recompense for, for work, for, for deeds that are, that are accomplished. It's a gift. You can brag about what you've earned. Look how hard I worked. Look at my, my high salary. I bought this house because I worked hard for it. That can, be, that can create boasting. We don't tend to boast about our gifts. We don't tend to say, wow, look how good I am. I've got this Christmas present from my kids. No, a, a, a wonderful gift reflects not on me. Who does it reflect on? The giver. That's the whole idea. My kids are great. Look what, they, look what they got my wife. Look what they got me. Aren't my kids wonderful? The goal of salvation isn't to bring glory to us. It's to bring glory to the giver. But for that to be true, it's got to be a gift. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, look at me. I had enough good on my scale to outweigh the bad. I did it. I won. Okay? That, that idea of boasting versus gratefulness is going to be a theme all through here. So the bottom line is this. Faith, not the works of the law, creates proper standing with God. And there's a phrase in verse 5 that, that jumps out. It creates a bit of a moral quandary. We have to be honest about it. It says, the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. When you really sit and, and rest in that phrase for a little bit, doesn't it sound a little bit unfair? Justify the ungodly? What's up with that? <laughs> okay. Again, part of us says, if, if, the, if the person on trial before the judge is guilty, declare him guilty. Throw the book at him. Make him, send him off to jail for knowing how long. If you believe in capital punishment, snuff him out. He deserves that. And yet God says he's ready to justify, meaning declare innocent, people who are guilty. It creates a bit of a moral quandary when we really dwell on it. But the problem is, if God isn't prepared to do that, we're all cooked. Right? Because we know we're all among the ungodly. I, I was walking through the gospel with a guy in France once, and uh, in the presentation I tend to use when I get a chance to share the gospel with somebody, I spend the whole first, uh, it's a four-part conversation, I spend the whole first part, uh, as a couple of you mentioned, what is sin? And why does it matter? And what impact does it make on me and my connection to God? And, and I, I do my best to expand the person's understanding of sin and their definition of it. Uh, like I said earlier, we tend to diminish the importance of sin. We make it, you know, the, the real bad sinners are, 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 are the guys who are in the headlines, in the news, and yeah, they deserve what they get. I'm not that bad. Okay? And so I, I, the presentation I use drives home the fact that if you want to picture one person without sin in human history, that's Jesus. How do you measure up to Jesus? What do you say, do, or think different from what he would if he were in your place? What do you not say, not do, not think that he would if he were in your place? The sins of commission and sins of omission. Not just, yeah, okay, I do bad things, but I fail to do the right things. And they all count. So insofar as whatever in my life reveals to someone watching me that I'm not Jesus, I've got a problem. And I even do some math with the person who's, who I'm walking through, and I, and I say, imagine that you only had one moment in a day that it was, would be clear to a watching person that you're not Jesus. Just once a day, do you fail to say or do or think what he would? Just once a day, do, do you do say or think something he wouldn't if he were there? Just once in a day. Does anyone know anybody who that describes? <laughs> that once a day, it's clear that you're a sinner. Of course not. But if you did have one per day, in a life of 70 years, how many sins would be on your account when you appear before a holy God? I did the math. 25,500 counts against you, of which you are guilty. 
and do the math if you want to figure out how many a day you would have on, on your record. How many, how, who could stand trials for 25,500 true counts of crime? And yet, you think we can stand in front of a holy God and say, oh, let me in. That was pretty good, 25,500. That's the holiest person I ever met. <laughs> and, and they would deserve judgment. Okay, and at that point in the presentation, talking with this guy in France, as it sunk in how significant his sin was, he looked at me and said, in French, he said, if that's what sin is, I'm cooked. <laughs> and I said, you're right. And I am too. And everybody who ever lived is. And so if God's not ready to justify the ungodly, if he's not ready to declare guilty people innocent on some grounds, we're all cooked. Mm -hmm. And we will all go to the hell that we deserve. But God wanted better for us. And so he found the way that Paul's going to explain here in the book of Romans. That's, and, the, that's the way it's going to be for those that haven't received the Lord. Isn't that a scary thought? Yeah. That, that, that those who think they're in such a good place because they're not as bad as everybody else are going to find they don't fare so well when they're compared to Jesus and not to their lousy neighbor. <laughs> okay. There's quite a difference between the two. Sure. Maybe it's just seeing it written out like this, but it just kind of popped out to me in verse 4. That when you work, your wages are due to you. And to just think that if you think that you're making your way by working, that you think God owes you something. It's due to me. Oh, yeah. And how terrible that sounds. Like oh, doesn't it? And, and you would never say it out loud. Sharon's pointing out that if, if you think you've worked hard enough and you should get what you deserve, that's, that's, that's an awful place to be spiritually. It's, it's the people who Jesus predicts in Matthew chapter 7. He says, on that day, many will come before me and say, Lord, Lord, look at my resume. Look at my list. This is the stuff I did. And, and it's impressive stuff. I cast out demons. I healed people in your name. I did this and that and the other thing. The, this is the ground of my acceptance by you. And, and Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Notice he doesn't dispute whether they did those things or not. Because that's, that's beside the point. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the resume says. Because on the other side of that scale is a whole lot of hair in your macaroni and cheese. <laughs> okay. All of which makes that list meaningless before a holy God. Those two sentences, four and five, uh -huh. what jumped out to me is the, the difference in the, in the words, and you don't see in in uh, verse four, believe, justify, faith, or righteousness. Right. And so it really does lead just to the works. Of the that, that jumped out at me yeah. as well. But five jumped out as me because I thought, oh, thank God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But well, it's, my faith can count as holy behavior. My right. faith can count as, as righteousness. Yeah. What a deal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't it feels a little down. bit like a free ride. Okay, great transition to my next point. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kim. Uh, there is some tension here, <laughs> and let's acknowledge it. There is a, a debate in Christendom that has been for centuries about how extreme what we're saying sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and the too good to be true argument comes up. So, and, and people who say, no, you guys are making too big a deal, and you're, 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 you're elevating some ideas that need to be balanced, they'll usually turn to James chapter 2. Because James famously says, faith without works is dead. Okay, so, there are, so it, when, when theologians debate uh, how true this is what I'm saying, they'll often say, but you're totally ignoring the book of James. This seems to come at it from a very different angle. Uh, and and if, you, if you read, I'll let you read later, we don't really take that much time now, but it's James 2.24 that is the sticky verse. And let's recognize as we, as we become Bible scholars, can I use that word, as we become, we become theologians, which we all are, by the way, we always just need a study of God. If you're studying God, you are a theologian, whether you call yourself that or not. The question isn't, are you or are you not a theologian? The question is, how good a one are you? <laughs> okay. So if you take seriously the principles of, of Scripture and hermeneutics and the things we talk about in this class, you can be responsible and, and handle Scripture wisely. And we have to face the fact that James 2.24 creates tension with this idea. 
Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with tension between passages. And we're going to see that a lot as we go forward in the book of Romans. And James 2 does create this tension to the point where Martin Luther, who I've quoted several times in the first three weeks of this class, who famously rediscovered this whole idea of justification by faith alone. That's the, that's the phrase that is used by the reformers in the, in, the, in the 16th century. He's the one who popularized that and started a whole movement that we're part of. Uh, he did not like the book of James. Uh, he would rather it not be in the Bible, <laughs> quite frankly. He called it an epistle of straw. Uh, I'm not sure what that meant in his context, but yeah, it, it's, he just he didn't want to deal with it because it's so clearly, I'll use the word contradicted, it's so clearly contradicted what Paul says here in, in Romans 3 and 4. And we have, to, we have to recognize that tension and have an answer for it. And here's my answer for it. James and Paul are addressing two different audiences. Paul is addressing, obviously in this passage especially, people who think, I need to obey the, the law of the Old Testament in order for God to accept me. And Paul is saying, it's not your obedience that puts you in his good graces, it's, it's your faith. James is addressing a different, different audience. He's addressing the people who may, maybe, maybe you know them, I, I, I know many of them, who had some kind of a faith experience at some point in their life, walked the aisle at a, at a Billy Graham crusade, or had a, an amazing experience at the Christian camp, and when they got past that experience, their life never changed a bit. They went, back, they went on living the way they always had, but someone told them, hey, once you pray this prayer, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll check the box. that will give you eternal life, and, and you can go off and basically, well, nobody would say this, but it's what people hear. I mean, I can live however I want, but if I've just had this moment and prayed this prayer, I'll be okay, and God will, will let me in. And James is saying to those folks, no, there's no way that could be true. Uh, and it is possible to bring the two th streams of thought together. I think I do have a slide on this right there. Go to the next thought, would you? It's, it's possible to say both Paul and James would agree with this idea. We are truly saved by faith alone. Paul. But faith that saves is never alone. Faith that is true, sincere commitment to, to saying, yes, I throw myself on you, Jesus, I trust you for my salvation, that creates a spiritual dynamic in the life of the person so that works begin to happen. Change, transformation takes place. They become people they didn't used to be. That's not what saves them. It's the evidence they already are saved. Okay? James would say, James would love the second half of because he says, you show me your, your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works, he says. So they're really addressing two different audiences, and in some ways, using the words in two different ways. For Paul, faith is a true, complete dependence upon the death of Jesus on the cross. For James, faith is, yeah, maybe mental assent might be a term we could use. I don't dispute Jesus, I don't disagree with Jesus, that doesn't mean I'm committed to believe in Jesus. That person who isn't truly in the family of God, has not experienced the Holy Spirit, ought to be asking themselves some hard questions. Now this becomes really nitty gritty when you're talking to somebody who has lived, uh, somebody in my French church, I remember, came, came to us, came back to Christ in his terms. He hadn't really been living as a Christ follower for 20 years had had, way back in his past, a powerful moment, a, a, a significant experience with, with faith and with Jesus. Uh, and usually, when I came across people like that to this day, I don't assume anything. I don't assume their initial experience was true saving faith. I'll say something to them like, wait a minute, let's, let's start at the beginning. I don't want to treat this as a, a, a recommitment of yourself to Jesus. As long as you've been in what we might call a prodigal experience, as long as that's lasted, let's just go back to the beginning and make sure. So I'll walk them through the gospel. This one guy, by the time we were done talking, I really did come to believe he was a sincere believer all along. Just things happened, and, and he was coming back to an earlier faith. There was another young woman in France. We're still friends to this day. I'm about to do a wedding for friends of theirs in Houston next year. <laughs> anyway... Uh, I, I walked her, she, she had a very typical experience, faith experience as a teenager and then as a young adult, drifted, walked away, married a guy who wasn't interested, had kids, and as she began realizing I'm responsible for a child now, wanted to get her spiritual life in order. So she came to talk, talk to me. 
And as I always do, I walked her through this gospel presentation, assuming that she was coming back to a sincere earlier faith. When we got to the fourth study, and I, I told her, well, why don't we have a prayer time right now, and, and you thank the Lord for bringing you back to your earlier commitment to him. She interrupted me and said, Mike, if what we've been talking about is the gospel, I'm not coming back. I'm coming for the first time. Mm -hmm. I've never grasped all this stuff. I assumed it was up to me. So we've very much changed the prayer <laughs> that we had over the next few minutes. And praise the Lord, she's still walking with Jesus now. Uh, it's fun to stay in touch with them. So you see where the, where, where the, the contrast between James and Paul becomes significant. Uh, and if you, if you understand, the, the two words are justification and sanctification. We're going to hear that quite a bit in the next few weeks, and, and hopefully by the time we're done. The distinctions between them and the, the order between them is going to be more and more clear all the time. Mike, how does yeah. being born again fit with this? Good question. How does being born again fit with this? Because the famous we all need to ask for that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the famous uh, line of Jesus to Nicodemus. You, you must be born again. Uh, the, the phrase can be used in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, I can say how I use it. I use it to describe a sincere, new spiritual birth. Uh, the, the fancy theological word is regeneration. At what point in your life do you become regenerated? Do you become reborn spiritually? You're no longer just a part of the family of human beings. You're now part of the family of God. By faith in Jesus. That, that happens at that moment, I believe when you surrender and put your trust in Christ. That of, of the many things that happen in that moment, and there's a whole list of them, uh, if we ever do a, a, a class called Ascent, we'll go through all the different things that happen. Leah's pushing me to do that one too. Uh, that the things that happen in that moment when you bow the knee to Jesus, and whether you want to call it in praying a prayer, or trust in Christ, or accepting Jesus into your heart, or there's all kinds of phrases we use, uh, that regeneration is one of the things that happens in that moment. Oh, and you also become your walk. Hmm? Also your walk. Well, the, the, the walk follows that. Yeah. And, and then, there, then you get to sanctification. Regeneration is justification. And now you ask yourself, what kind of person should I be? How should this, my new identity, to use Matt's word, how should my new identity flush itself out in my life? What in my life right now is worthy of someone who's a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God? And what in my life doesn't fit in light of who I've now become? And, and the process of growing into that new identity is what we call sanctification. Becoming holier is what sanctification means. Uh, justification comes first, then sanctification. Born again, and then the transformation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. And I think I was trying to kind of place that in between Paul's and James the tension right. verses yeah. and thinking who they were addressing. Interesting. And I just That's a good exercise. It's <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong with connecting dots in scripture. It, right. it, okay. it, it can be challenging, but it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, well, it's still not quite there, but you've filled in a very good Glad to hear that. It's a good exercise. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, time is, is fleeing. I love this, this discussion, but I do want to get through a little, at least a little bit more. In verse 6, he changes from Abraham to David. He's obviously bringing up the heroes that any Jewish Christ follower would look up to. And he's already said Abraham experienced salvation by faith. Now he's going to say the same thing about David. Verse 6, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God accounts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Uh, and, and, and in that context, by the way, he's quoting uh, Psalm... Where am I? I've lost my... Oh, Psalm 32 is where that, that uh, passage comes from. And, and he's saying, because of, he uses the word count uh, in verse 8, he's connecting that to Abraham having his faith counted to him as righteousness. And David uses it in a little different way. He's saying, when, when you put that faith, not only are, does that become counted as righteousness, but the sins you have committed have been forgiven. So that negative side of your ledger is washed clean, and the positive side that had nothing in it before suddenly is full of righteousness. But that's how dramatic the, the moment is when you bow the knee to Jesus. The, the, the number of things that happen in that moment is, is mind-boggling. 
So we have the brief, brief uh, digression into David, but then he goes back to Abraham in verse 9. I'm going to read 9 through 12. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? He's addressing that prideful Jewish believer who thinks, this is for us. And everyone else has got to be like us. Everybody else around us needs to adopt our laws and our rules and get circumcised and eat like we do. They've got to, they've got to become Jewish to be Christians. And what Paul's about to say here is, hey, not even Abraham was Jewish <laughs> when he became declared righteous. He's going to make that case now. Uh, end of verse 9. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? Big issue there for someone for whom that outside act of circumcision is a saving moment. We made the comparison to baptism a couple of weeks ago. That for some people, that baptism moment, usually in a, in a baby context, by being baptized as a baby, your sins are, the original sin is washed away and you become cleansed. Again, that's all it takes. Uh, he goes on to say, it wasn't after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. That sentence is long. <laughs> it could be a little mind-boggling. But his point is this. Abraham was given the ritual of circumcision 14 years after his faith declared him righteous. If you look at the timeline of the Old Testament, nothing, the law wasn't given yet. Obviously, that came generations later with Moses. There were, was no commandment to obey at that point. He wasn't being a good enough boy in God's eyes to be declared okay. And not even circumcision existed yet. When God said of Abraham, your faith makes you righteous in my eyes. And Paul makes the point that Abraham is the father of all who are right with God by faith. Those who came from a Jewish background, like him, and, ex and experienced the Jewish rituals, and those who came from a non-Jewish background, because when this happened to Abraham, he, you wouldn't really call him Jewish yet. If your de definition of Jewish was kosher eating, circumcision, all the rest, it didn't exist. So he's saying Abraham is a model for everybody. The Jews and the Greeks are declared just because of their faith, not because of their works. Let's go on. I think we'll be able to, to finish the chapter today. It's, it's not a long time for those others. Uh, I'll read verses 14 and 15. Uh, where am I? Oh, no, 13, sorry. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is no, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, we already saw that. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that last phrase. It, it's a bit of a head stretcher. I'm just going to say, because he's already made it clear that, that non-Gentiles who don't get the law and never read the law, they still stand guilty before God. That last phrase can't mean where there's no awareness of God's rules, there's no sin. Of course there is. He's made that clear elsewhere. I believe what he's saying is where there's where there's no uh, awareness of the law, there's no awareness of the transgression. But the average Gentile thinks they're fine. This is how we do things. There's no conviction. There's no conviction. No. The, 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 apart from the, the testimony of what they call general revelation, creation, that, that show God's existence, there's no details, there's no specifics. I, I, my ministry's taken me to parts of the world where people have all kinds of ideas of what it takes to be right in the spiritual realm. Uh, and they've landed there because they've never heard anything different. A Jewish person would know, these are God's expectations of me, and now I'm aware of where I fall short. In, in many ways, that's a blessing. If you fall short, better to know <laughs> that you fall short than not. Again, one of the privileges of being a partner of the people of Israel. Okay? Uh, verse 16. That's why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, the Jews, 
but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Jews and Gentiles. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believes, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Again, there's a lot there to unpack. I, I won't dig very deeply into it, except to say, to point out the, the, the connection between faith and grace. He says that, I think, in verse uh, 16. Thank you. In order that the promise may rest on grace, which is undeserved favor. Undeserved favor with God. That's what the word grace means. And be guaranteed to all his offspring, Jewish and Gentile, that, that's, that that connection between the two. Faith activates the grace of God, which is the undeserved favor of a holy God on undeserving people. The more we grasp that, the, the better off we'll be. So let's look at verse 18. Uh, read 18 through 22, and we're approaching the end of the chapter. In hope, he, Abraham, believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he'd been told by God, so shall your offspring be. Now here's a, here's a passage of a little bit of a head-scratcher. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No one belief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That last phrase is pretty cool, but it, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit mystifying if you know the history of Abraham after he heard these promises. We wouldn't give him an A+, plus in how he lived out his life after being told by God, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be the father of nations. Look at the stars. You can't count them. The sand on the seashore. There's going to be so many of your people. Uh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. And he looked around and went, wait, wait a minute. I'm 100 years old. I have no kids. And, and he, he, he asked God questions about that in further conversations. Uh, he actually assumed that uh, the passage we read, which was traditional at the time, that uh, a, a servant born in his household might become his heir. That was a common solution. If someone dies childless, who's going to get my land? Who's going to get my home? Who's going to take care of my family? Well, it would be maybe your favorite servant born in your home would become almost a family, yeah, legally a family member. God said, no, no, that's not it. You're going to have a son. And then, then uh, uh, Sarah had the great idea, hey, why don't you sleep with my maid? And her son will be your son. And, and Abraham went along with that. Okay, we're not given much insight into his thinking uh, on that day. Uh, being a guy, I think we would probably assume what he was thinking. Sorry. <laughs> but we wouldn't necessarily hold him up as an example of faith in that moment. And this passage gives him a pretty, pretty clean bill of health. Uh, it, could, it could be that in that context, uh, he was seen as him having kind of going along with Sarah's idea. Uh, but famously, uh, Ishmael, his, his uh, son through the servant, Hagar, was not the son of the promise. He himself became, because God is, is true beyond what he needs, is faithful to his promises beyond what we might require of him, uh, Abraham's offspring also became nations. The Edomites, the Moabites, uh, who, who else was uh, up there, were all descendants of Ishmael. Yeah, Edomites, uh, and today's Muslim nations, all trace their ancestry back to Ishmael. In fact, in Islam, Ishmael was the, the son Abraham offered uh, as an almost sacrifice on Mount Moriah. That if you talk to a, a, a Muslim friend, that story isn't Isaac, it's Ishmael. Because they trace back their Abrahamic faith, they trace their existence back through Ishmael. Uh, so, it, it becomes, you see how God didn't have to do it, but he did bless Ishmael physically in the ways that God promised to bless Abraham. He didn't bless Ishmael's descendants uh, spiritually. And we'll see the same thing happen between Esau and Jacob later on. That in each generation, there's a chosen one through whom the spiritual blessings pass. Uh, and those spiritual blessings will create other kinds of tensions within the families, which gets kind of interesting. All right, so we can say the scripture says he didn't waver. I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, obviously, that's what God says. Uh, but I'll say God's being quite gracious <laughs> to Abraham. Because you and I might say, well, he could have done better. And, and, and no doubt he could have. And yet, eventually, there is a miracle moment that despite the fact that she laughed when she first heard that that prophecy was made specifically about her, 
not just going to be Abraham's son, he's going to be Abraham and Sarah's son. When she heard that repeated, she laughed uh, in the next room. And, and God heard. <laughs> and I said, what are you laughing for? I didn't laugh. That's what we do, right? <laughs> we three to nine. All right. I'll read 23 through 25 to finish. Uh, then we'll take any questions or comments you might have. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. I love this part. But for ours also. Is that a summary of scripture right there? It's not written just for the people who lived it or the people who read it in Rome or read it in Ephesus. It's written not just for them, but for, for us also. And he goes on to say, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What is Paul saying here? I've got a closing slide on this, I think. Yeah. Paul is saying here, the problem of sin is our problem. We saw that in, in Romans 1 through the beginning of 3. The gift of righteousness is our solution. That's the end of chapter 3. And here in chapter 4, we're learning Abraham's experience can be our experience. That when we grasp the importance of the trust that Abraham showed, when we exercise that faith in Jesus, we are declared righteous the same way he was. We step into spiritual blessings the same way he did. The benefits of what Jesus did on the cross, which will be clarified in the next few chapters, become applied to us. And we begin the life of transformation that naturally follows that, ex that expression of faith. And we'll see that all through the end of the book of Romans. Is this an amazingly organized book? <laughs> Amazing points looking back into history. Later we'll look forward into you know, everyday life today. But I really want to, I want us to stress the hour there. That's why I made it a bit in yellow. Uh, it's our, that's what Paul wanted his readers to say to themselves. <coughs> Abraham's experience isn't unique. It's designed to be a model for everyone. All through the Roman Empire. And now 2,000 years later. It's designed to be a, 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 our experience all over the world. As this good news of Jesus launched on the day of Pentecost is now spreading around the world. Uh, my wife and I just this week are taking on responsibilities to give pastoral care to missionaries in Latin America and Asia in 14 different nations. So we're going to get front row seats uh, to hear what God is doing to make himself known and loved and worshipped in corners of the world that you and I can't imagine. Because Abraham's experience is being repeated every day around the world as people express faith in Jesus and it is counter to us not just Abraham. It's counted to us today as righteousness in God's eyes. It's a pretty good deal. <laughs> not one to pass up. All right. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Matt. I have two. I have a comment and a question. Okay. okay. I'll try to be brief. Uh, the comment, I, I've just heard it said before when we were discussing the Old Testament, it's always like very law driven. And. I think this is just such a glorious passage because it shows there's always been sexual around Jesus. Even though Jesus wasn't there yet, it was a faith that was counted to them, believing that God would deliver on his promise, is what sent those people to heaven. Exactly. Not the law or exactly. any priest, prophet, anything like that. They yeah. didn't have to do that. Lord, that's what Jesus. So that, that's a comment. Let me comment on that because I love what you just said. And, and when we talk about law, we have to remember it's not just the commands to obey. It also includes the means to receive forgiveness when you don't obey. Yeah. So the entire temple sacrificial system, the, the festivals, the Passover lamb, it's all caught up in that law. Yeah. So it's like God knew in advance, I'm going to give you all these rules, you're going to blow it. <laughs> and so embedded in that whole system is when you blow it, here's what you do. Here's how you can experience the grace and the forgiveness that you don't deserve. Because an innocent sacrifice died in your place. And hello, crucifixion. Thousands of years later. Exactly. Okay, what's your question on that? So the question is, at the end of uh, verse 17, it says, God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead. Is that referring specifically to Abraham holding that belief? Oh. Uh, that just kind of stood out to me. Right. Uh, who was believing that God gives life to the dead? And just being on the context of that, why would they believe that? Interesting question. Yeah. I'm going to give a, uh, for the video, he's asking who, who's being talked about in verse 17. Uh, who, someone who believed God gives life to the dead. Uh, I'm going to assume he's still talking about Abraham, and I'm, I'm 
leaning on what was going to come later with the sacrifice of Isaac. That's what I was saying. Yeah, I guess it was the first Peter or James that says, he was so sure God would keep his promises that if I take my son's life, God will resurrect him. And what a mind-boggling idea when he's never heard of resurrection before. Yeah. You and, I, you and I would say, well, yeah, of course. If Jesus did it, and Jesus experienced it. We're all going to be risen from the dead. But here's Abraham. If I let this knife drop, God will fix it. It's pretty amazing thing. Maybe that's what verse 21 alludes to. Fully convinced. You don't fully convinced that I was able to do what he brought. Exactly. Yeah, the level of trust in this. Uh, when, you, when you put it in the context of what he'd experienced and what he'd heard and learned about this God, who he just got to know a little while ago. Okay? He didn't have centuries of history with the God of Israel. Israel didn't exist yet. <laughs> he had a few conversations. And yet he put such trust in, in the revelation that God made of himself that he became this father of many nations, physically and spiritually. Great question. Thanks, man. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, that's what I see in the beauty of the Bible, is that it's full of details, and it's just like a, a, a beautiful work of art. So if you're standing there looking at this beautiful detail of this piece of art, until you stand back and look at the entire piece, you don't get the big picture. And so I think it's full of details that points to the long game. Isn't that amazing? It's true, so true. The, the scripture is so full of details, and it rewards careful study. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about it. I've been studying it for oh, 50 years now. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm finding stuff. You know, and the beauty of connecting dots and seeing what this means. I never got that before. Now I get it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quote something that I've got in my file somewhere. Maybe I'll bring it next week. Remind me later to bring this next week. I'm going to misquote a quote about the beauty of Scripture. That it is a collection of 66 books written by, I think, 45 authors in three languages on, I think, three or four continents over the course of 1,500 years with one central theme and one unified message. We'd have trouble doing that today with copies and computers and all this stuff. But when you think it was done by God, supervised by the Holy Spirit, in all those different places, by all those different people, you know, from different cultural contexts, okay? And yet, when you read it, it's got this, this thread, this theme. It's, I got goosebumps this thing. <laughs> I'll bring you that exact quote next week. We will remind you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Paul. If you listen to Chuck Mickler, uh, he's on the radio about 2.30 on 91.3. Uh -huh. He said the same thing. 66.40, and then he goes through the, through the uh, uh, how many authors and how many, yeah. uh, uh, I don't know, how many authors and what else? I think it was 45 uh, writers, uh, if I remember right. But yeah, the, Paul, for the video, Paul's saying that a similar, he's heard a similar thing on the radio. That just, just lifts up the beauty of Scripture and the unified the unity of it. The more you dig into it, the more you shake your head and go, Lord, only you could have pulled this off. Mm -hmm. Only you could have pulled this off. I still marvel at the, to complete that, that we have it, that these things were not destroyed, these ancient documents. Yeah. That they were preserved and then brought together yeah. to create the picture for each of us individually yeah. for life with him for eternity. Yeah. And I look at this book and, and when I read it I actually sometimes just find myself stopping praying and touching the pages. Oh, yeah. I mean it's very physical, but it's like I just want it all. Yeah. And the fact that it exists is such the fact that scripture exists that God preserved it and the yeah. same the same Martin Luther that we've been quoting here is one of the first to say this needs to be in the hands of the average person. And, and in his day, the Bible only exists in the Latin. You didn't, nobody had access to it. You had to trust what the priest said about it at the Mass. And Martin Luther, would, he wasn't the first, but he was the first one to live long enough to do it because the, the, the elders were all martyred. But there was a real movement for several hundred years to put the Bible in common language. And Martin Luther translated it into German. And, and that, that launched uh, new, new translations of the Bible all over the world. And I've got friends who are doing that now for tribes in Indonesia. And uh, they've actually got the number of languages that don't yet have scripture in their language. They know how many there are now. Uh, and there's partnership between mission agencies to, 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 to correlate, to, to collaborate, to make sure we're getting the Bible in the language of these folks, the same way Martin Luther did in the Reformation.
we have it in English because people died. So we could have it in English. Yeah. Quick comment, I think by 2030 the Bible will be Everyone. They do have, yeah, they do have target dates. Uh, they moved it back a few times. <laughs> they keep finding new languages, which is the whole idea. But yes, uh, in our lifetime, uh, people are saying the translation of the Bible into the languages of the world could be completed. It's a pretty amazing project. So, is that an assumption then that the translation of the Bible into other languages will yeah, yeah, that's a big debate. She's asking whether that, that fulfills Christ's prediction. The gospel will be preached, uh, and then the end will come, Jesus says. How, how you define gospel being preached uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, it, it being in their language is a great start. Uh, but there's an old saying among Bible translators. The best day in the life of the Bible translator is the dedication of the completed scripture in the language they've worked on for 30 years. That's the best day of their life. The worst day in their life is to come back a year later and find that people are putting it under the pillow at night, hoping to absorb it, or chopping up pages to put in the soup, to eat it. That the, the presence of the physical book is a good start, but it's a lousy place to stop. <laughs> and, and needing to make sure there's comprehension of it. The, the preaching of the gospel is the key. Printing the gospel will help us get there, but there's still got to be verbal proclamation, explanation, and call the people to follow Jesus. That's the method Jesus used. It's the method the early church used. It's the method that's working around the world. Yeah. And Bible translation is part of it, but it's not the end of the world. All right, let's close on that point. Let me pray for us, and I wish you all a wonderful week. Lord, we do stand amazed at the intricacies of your book. And Lord, would you make us people of the book? Would you make us people who love your word and, and rest in it and absorb it and marinate in it and, and love it? and put it into practice most of all. But thank you for this reminder that we are just in your eyes because we have trusted your son Jesus. We rest in that. That is our only hope of eternal life. And we thank you that your book makes that so clear. Would you give us a great week walking with you, uh, enjoying this wonderful season, and, and open our eyes to those around us who need to know what we know about you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.